everyone. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here and we are delighted that you've joined us this morning in worship. want to lift up just a couple of things before we continue in worship. Um, as always, we need your help to make that welcome personal and effective. And so we have a sign-up for our September hospitality, and I'm going to go back where there's a crowd to get that started. But if you are able and can do something on one Sunday, that would be a great help. Our youth are putting on a very fun and delicious event for us in just a little while, and they're going to tell us all about it. Today, after the service, we are having our annual uh, youth barbecue fundraiser. Yep. So, come, so come on back. We'll have hamburgers, hot dogs, pulled chicken, mac and cheese, and all sorts of sides. It'll be really delicious. And um, donations are welcome to help us towards the youth fund for our work and activities for the rest of the year. We look forward to seeing you guys after the service. I'm sure we'll be able to smell some of that good cooking as we get near the end, just to tempt you. So come on back. We uh, want to again say thanks to everyone who has contributed. We have delivered, uh, I do not know the final count, but over 500 individual items by your generosity to the children at Arlington Elementary for them to start school with the tools they need to be successful. So thank you. If you still want to contribute, there are lists of what is needed, and we would still welcome those if you would like to do that. You see the other announcements that are there. I um, want to remind you that our Family Promise Week is coming up soon, um, about two weeks to three weeks away, September 8th. It'll begin on that Sunday, and we will have lists of those food items we need, and we will have a sign-up for host overnight hosts and for other things that may be needed, uh, probably beginning next Sunday. Let us take a moment and make our welcome more personal before we continue in worship. If you're able, stand and greet someone, welcome someone new this morning. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our 
forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Are there any children that want to come up today for our children's time? I think they're checking the nursery there. I've got a volunteer. Come on up. Good morning. Mommies and grandparents, you're welcome too. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Why don't you sit next to me? Yeah. There we go. I am so glad you are all here. Is everybody starting school these days? Good. That's good. And we're going to learn lots of things, right? It's good to learn. You know, learning changes us. But you know what? Change is good. Sometimes we don't like things to change. We like them the same. But God wants us to keep changing for the better all the time. And that's what following Jesus is all about. Changing for the better all the time. As you learn new things, it's going to make you better at school and better at home. And different. And so those are all good things. God helps us change and grow. Let's say thank you to God for helping us change and grow. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for helping us change and grow no matter what age we are. Bless those who teach us and help us to keep learning and growing and changing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up this morning. It's good to see everybody. And we're going to continue with our next song, if you are able and would like to stand, we welcome you to do that. And join us as we sing of the strength of our God.
hear us as we confess that the way things are, are not that way. Help us to have the strength to turn from other gods, from putting those gods that are less powerful in charge of our lives. Help us to turn from them. Help us to repent and turn back to you, O oh God, to trust your word, your love, your power, and your righteousness. O oh, living Christ, you call us to follow in your way. You call us to change. You call us to grow in spirit. You call us to act on our faith. Continue to show us the way. Help us to know what is right and good. And even more, help us to do what is right and what is good. Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, we pray for strength to do what is right. We pray for the inspiration to commit our lives to the way of Christ. Help us not simply to feel better about ourselves as things are. Help us to know with you and with God change is possible. You have promised a new creation, a new reality. Help us to live into that, Holy Spirit. And grant us the healing, the blessing, the joy that comes following your way. And hear us as we pray for the healing and blessing of many on our hearts this day. We pray for your continued healing with Day Day. We continue to pray your comfort with those who have lost loved ones. The Hibbert family. The Keating family. Hear us too as we lift up Dow and Donna. We pray for Larry and Gretchen. Hear us as we lift up Virginia and Dottie. Hear us too as we pray for those communities that are suffering from the gun violence in our nation violence in our hearts. Help us to repent and turn that we might be a people of love, of justice, and of peace. And hear us as we pray in these silent moments for those things we have not spoken of and even those prayers for which we have no words. And as we listen for you, our still speaking God, Lord, in your mercy.
God of blessing, we give you thanks for all that we have received from your loving heart. You have given us life and all that sustains us. We bring these tithes and offerings in gratitude. May they be used to your glory in serving the people we serve through our ministries here and our church's wider mission everywhere. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, our scripture lesson, as we continue from the scriptures in the Hebrew Bible that we share, is the story of Nehemiah. Perhaps you have heard that name before around here. This is the story of the first Nehemiah assembly. Listen for the word of the Lord, as it is found in Nehemiah 5, 1 through 12. Now there was a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish kin. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many. We must get grain so that we may eat and stay alive. There were also those who said, We are having to pledge our fields, our vineyards, and our houses in order to get grain during the famine. And there were those who said, we're having to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay the king's tax. Now our flesh is the same as that of our kindred. Our children are the same as their children. And yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been ravished. We are powerless, and our fields and vineyards now belong to others. This is Nehemiah speaking says, I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these complaints. After thinking it over, I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are all taking interest from your own people. And I called a great assembly to deal with them. And said to them, as far as we are able, we have bought back our Jewish kindred who have been sold to other nations. But now you are selling your own kin, who must then be bought back by us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us stop taking, let us stop this taking of interest. Restore to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the interest on money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, We will restore everything and demand nothing more from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them take an oath to do as they had promised. Here ends the reading of this portion of God's holy word. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and even more our responding faithfully to it. Amen.
Thank you, Greg, and thank you, choir. Choir, it is wonderful to have you back, and you always inspire me, and I know you inspire us all with the beauty of the music you share. So, so good to have you back in our worship this morning. I've been promising for about three weeks now to get to the power to change things. We've been talking about what needs to change. And I guess I have to be sure that I'm not barking up the wrong tree. How many of you want to live in the best community you can live in? How many of you want Jacksonville to be the best community it can be? How many of you believe that it's worth working for? How many of you believe there are things that could change and should change in our community, in our world? If not, I want to come live with you because you've got it better than I do. Things need to change. But the reality is, as I said before, we often feel like we don't have the power to change. One of the things people often talk about is taking personal responsibility for your problems. And that's important. And I don't want to deny that that's something that where we have the power to change things, we ought to be working on. Sometimes, though, the reality is the things that we face, the problems in our community, are so large that, as we said, they're part of a system that is not functioning fairly for all. And most of us cannot do anything personally to change those by ourselves. But I want to suggest to you that what I believe faith calls us to do is to take personal responsibility for caring for others. And if we care for others, then we will find ways to help each other. We will find ways to help change those things that we can change and to find ways to continue to become powerful enough to change the things that need to change in big systems that can be changed and need to be changed in our community. So yes, I'm talking about the Nehemiah Assembly. Let me give you a little background on that passage. Nehemiah was a person who had at least some personal power. He was a cupbearer to the king of Persia. I assume a pretty cush job if you think testing the king's food and drink for poison before he ingests it is a cush job. So he had access to power. But the Israelites had been dragged off into exile by the king of Persia. But being something of a benevolent dictator, he had released some of them to go back and rebuild Jerusalem because Nehemiah had asked so. And Nehemiah ultimately went back to help rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, and did so. But in the midst of that effort, we come to today's lesson. It's describing a situation in Jerusalem that had come about due to famine, and due to people worshiping the God of prophet, more than the God of Israel, and the God of Jesus Christ. What had happened is they had begun, despite the Bible's forbidding of taking interest on loans, they had begun to charge their neighbors, their kin, their fellow citizens interest when they could not afford to buy the grain they needed to feed their children in the midst of the famine. And when they could not pay that back, they took their fields and vineyards so they had no way to make money to pay back that and the taxes by the king. So then they were forced to sell their children into slavery to those who were their own kin, who they owed money to, they could not repay. Now, scripture describes very clearly how Nehemiah generated the power to change that unjust, unfair system. First, he got angry. Then he thought about what needed to happen and thought about how to make a change and what it took. He did research, if you will. And then he called a great assembly. 
And he called the leaders, the nobles, and the officials before that group. And he said to them, here's what you're doing that's wrong. Not only is it wrong, but you are bringing shame on our God himself. Because our, our enemies see what you are doing, and they think our God doesn't care. Parentheses. I love it when people say, Christians shouldn't get involved in politics. Uh, did you read your Bible at all? Did you see who Jesus criticized, by the way? The religious authorities? The political authorities? End of parentheses. So he called the great assembly. And those nobles standing before all those people, what did they do? They made a very short, less than two minute speech. We will stop doing what is wrong, and we will start doing what is right. They not only said we will return the lands, the vineyards, we will return the interest we charged that we should never have charged. Hallelujah! Change is possible if we all take personal responsibility for each other and for making our community better. That began for Nehemiah with listening. How many of us listen to each other anymore in this day and time? Hi, how you doing? Fine, see you later. Or a short text, as short as we can make it on our phone. Maybe a Facebook shout out. But how many of us sit down and listen to where one another are hurting? To where one another needs something to change in their lives? And how many of us in listening care enough to try to see if we can make a difference? So that's why when we begin our community justice work, we begin the listening process. Many people don't choose to participate. No, they just want to hear what they want to hear, I've heard people say. Not true. We want to hear where people are hurting. We want to hear what makes people angry. We want to hear people talk about wakes them up at night. We want to talk about what's causing people difficulties they can't solve by themselves. Or maybe where we can help them. But we want to listen. We're going to start that listening process in another month, but I want to challenge you. Become involved. Maybe you don't think you've got anything that's causing you problems or making you angry. But do you care about your fellow worshipers who do? Do you care enough to listen? Because that's where change begins. Let me share with you, for example, what keeps me awake at night sometimes from a very personal point of view. My daughter Caroline turned 26 last spring. She has a number of chronic health issues that require ongoing medical care and prescriptions. Of course, in our current system, at 26, she could no longer be on our insurance. And her employer was not paying her enough to pay for insurance and rent and food to live. And he did not provide it as part of what was required because he had created this company so that he could spin it off from another company so it would be small enough so it wasn't legally required to offer insurance. Perfectly legal. It's all about the profit, right? Well, the result was that in that gap between where she had coverage and didn't, in order to renew a prescription that she had been receiving for over a year, her provider would not renew it unless she paid $1,200 up front just for the test, not for the prescription. In addition to take her back, she would not only have to pay back already the part she owed that was in collections, but she would have to be making almost $500 a month payments towards the debt that she had that was current, on top of all these other things. Friends, I don't know how you feel about health care. You may say it's too political an issue. I look at what Jesus did. Jesus healed people. That tells me God cares about our health care about our welfare, physically. 
That tells me that God does not intend us to suffer with illness and physical ailments. I believe, and you may disagree, that health care, basic health care, is a human right, not an option for those who can afford it or those who are wealthy enough to afford it. You may not realize, but health care in the United States was not a for-profit industry until 1973. True. In 1973, the current then president, one of his larger political donors, headed up an organization that was newly being created called a Health Maintenance Organization. Heard of those? Anybody heard of HMOs? That was illegal at the time. Voila, Congress passed a law not only establishing that, but creating funding to subsidize those who wanted to begin profit-making HMOs. Guess who was one of the first to get one of those subsidies? One of the president's biggest donors who has pushed for the changing of the law. Perfectly legal in our system, right? But as we continue to worship the prophet God over the God of Israel, God of Jesus Christ. We create a snake that is eating its own tail. We've been told for 20 or 30 years that if we just make those who are wealthiest wealthier, it will trickle down to those of us in the middle and below. But all the statistics I see show me that nobody in the middle or lower has had a real wage increase against the cost of living and against the rate of inflation the last 20 to 30 years. If we make profit the God we worship above all other gods, people will suffer. We must change. We must grow. We must turn to worshiping God. Who cares that we take personal responsibility, but also demands and commands that we take charge of personal responsibility for one another. We must build the power to change things because systems don't change when individuals cry out. But as we saw with the Nehemiah assembly that Nehemiah called, things can change when we put together people to look for change. But it begins with listening. When we listen, let me tell you what we've done. Last year, 500 fewer children and youth were arrested for minor childish crimes, like stealing a can of soda, or underage drinking. 500 children and youth have a better chance to get into the college they want to get into, to get into the armed forces, to get a job that they otherwise could not get because of an arrest record for something so silly that probably many of us have done many of those things ourselves. We just didn't get caught. And on top of that, we saved this city 2.2 million dollars in one year alone. We can change things. We can make this city a better place. But we must begin by listening to one another, hearing one another's pain, and thinking about how we can respond so that we can make a difference. I believe the Christian faith calls us to personal responsibility. I believe it calls us to faith. And I believe faith is a verb. That faith demands we act on what we believe. And so that's the opportunity that listening to one another gives. That building power together to hold officials accountable, to do what is good for all the people, to make this community better. You've heard me talk about this a lot. You may say I'm tired of hearing it. But there's more we can do. And there's more of us who can be part of it. And I want to challenge you to change, to grow. Because if the only thing you come to church on Sunday for is to feel better about how things are, how you are, I've wasted 20 years and a lot of hot air. But I know that we can work together to make a difference. And I know with the power of God, the Almighty, the one whose love is just and whose justice 
his love calls us to it. As we know, each of us has our own problems, our own challenges. Do we care enough to listen? Do we care enough to do what we can? Let us be people that when they talk about us, they say they cared enough to do something. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, you have shown us by example. You have called us by your commandments. You have opened the way through Jesus Christ, whom we call Lord and Savior. Help us to make you the one God that we worship. Help us to turn from false gods that lead to death. And let us turn to you, the God of life. And let us bring everyone we can with us into your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able, we'll sing our closing song called As Partners. It's a familiar tune. You may not know all the words, but Greg is going to lead us so that you can hear the melody. Let us stand as we're able and sing.